Those two simple words, get out, sliced through the whirling tension, and left me completely astonished. The wife of my eldest son was the one who issued this command. It reminded me of a similar expulsion I'd experienced years before when I left my parents' house. The idea of being ejected from yet another house made me feel a sharp surge of rage. I stood my own and said, well, I'll leave then, my voice quivering with a mixture of sorrow and wrath. I started to gather my things with a purpose, making a quiet promise that this would be the last straw in a long list of grievances. I made a self-promise to never forgive the wife of my eldest son for this slight. I realized it was time to implement my strategy as I was packing my belongings. My daughter-in-law, Jessica, had driven me to this point, and I had to deal with her behavior. But first, let me introduce myself before we get started. I'm Nora Clark, and this year I'll be turning 61. Even though I am officially retired, I still count myself lucky to be working, but not in the conventional sense. I work primarily from home these days, just visiting the office once in a while for meetings. With the evolution of the modern workplace, working remotely is now commonplace. On the other hand, it appears like my oldest kid has misconceptions about my life right now. He sees me as just living in his house and not working anymore. I was widowed in my 40s and have generally lived a comfortable life. My late husband's insurance payout is mostly unaltered, so I won't have to worry about money in my later years. Despite the impression that I lead a carefree life, I do have some worries. Jessica, the wife of my oldest son, is foremost among them. Jessica possesses a strong-willed personality and frequently finds herself at odds with me. This isn't a recent development. It began when she first came to announce their impending marriage. I can't forget the audacious act of showing up in a tracksuit as if it were the most natural thing in the world. She claimed she wanted me to see her without any pretense, but I couldn't help but see it as a breach of common sense and decorum. To put it mildly, her behavior often borders on the absurd, and her unwavering confidence and articulate arguments only complicate matters. I often wondered why my eldest son had chosen her as his life partner, and I later learned that it was Jessica who had approached him. Despite her eccentricities, there was no denying her beauty, and it seemed that my somewhat sheltered son was completely smitten with her. Even after their marriage, Jessica's behavior remained consistent. She wasn't one to put on airs, but also seemed to lack an understanding of social norms. As much as I wanted to oppose their marriage, I restrained myself, believing it was what my son truly desired. Unfortunately, the consequences of my decision were manifesting before my eyes. Surprisingly, my son was adamant about us all living together in our family home after the wedding. I had initially expected Jessica to oppose this arrangement, but to my surprise, she was in favor of it. It didn't take long for the reasons behind her preference to become clear. After we started living together, Jessica seemed to have completely abdicated her responsibilities when it came to household chores, leaving me to bear the entire burden. From cleaning to laundry and meal preparation, she entrusted all these tasks to me. What baffled me even more was that she was a full-time housewife who had willingly quit her job at the time of our marriage. While I didn't have to commute to work daily, I still had a remote job that demanded a substantial portion of my time, leaving me with even less free time than her. As I diligently faced my computer screen to fulfill my job responsibilities, Jessica would often make belittling comments insinuating that I was merely playing around. At first, I brushed off her remarks with a laugh, deeming it too troublesome to engage in an argument every time. However, as time passed, it became increasingly irksome to endure her constant undermining. One day, unable to bear the imbalance in her household duties any longer, I decided to approach Jessica with a simple request, asking if she could lend a hand with the cleaning 
considering the ample free time she appeared to have. At that moment, she was oddly engrossed in a TV drama, and her reaction was far from positive. With a deeply disgusted expression, she sighed dramatically and retorted, The reason I don't involve myself in housework is for your sake, dear. Why can't you understand? It's disheartening that you can't appreciate my thoughtfulness. In a rather peculiar turn of logic, she justified her refusal to contribute to household chores by claiming that doing so would deprive me of my sole job. According to her, this would lead to a sedentary lifestyle for me, which she argued was unhealthy. Moreover, she expressed concerns about the potential development of dementia due to a lack of mental stimulation. In other words, Jessica believed that allowing me to handle all the housework was somehow in my best interest. Her reasoning bordered on the absurd, and I couldn't help but shake my head in disbelief. In an attempt to lighten the situation, I reminded her, we decided to live together so that you can make sure I don't slack off, dear. Her response, delivered with a half-smile, left me utterly speechless and confused. It was at that moment that I began to deeply regret our decision to cohabitate. Every day felt like an ordeal as I found myself laboring over household chores under Jessica's watchful eye. Frustrated in feeling like I was at my breaking point, I decided to confide in my eldest son. My intention was not to complain about Jessica, but to find a solution to my predicament. I explained to him the difficulties of living in our current house, which was old and riddled with level differences. My age and physical condition had taken a toll, resulting in a back injury the previous year. These challenges made daily life increasingly arduous for me. Following our conversation, I made the decision to move into an apartment. It felt like Jessica had driven me to this choice, though I had no regrets about leaving. The new apartment I secured was a rental, and while I initially thought it might be too spacious for me to live alone, I ensured that it had enough room for my grandchildren to stay over in the future. I even had the interior customized to my taste, and at last, my own personal castle was complete. However, my joy was short-lived, as Jessica began coming over to the new apartment every day, staying until late into the evening. She lounged on the living room couch, looking around and commenting, The new apartment is really nice, isn't it, mother? It might be too big for just you. Why don't you come back to your old home and take care of the house chores? It's for your health and longevity, you know. Jessica's behavior had become unbelievably frustrating. She insisted that I return to our old house to take care of the chores during the day and her self-centeredness was enough to make anyone dizzy. I had already moved out of that house, and it was time for her to step up as the wife and handle the household responsibilities. After all, I was the one taking care of all the house chores in my new place, and my annual checkups always came back with good results. There was really nothing for Jessica to worry about. However, when I confronted Jessica about this, she simply turned her head away, as if pretending not to hear my words. It was her usual strategy to ignore anything that was inconvenient for her. Yet, even after this confrontation, Jessica continued to visit my apartment regularly. Just the other day, she casually mentioned that going back to the old house was too much of a hassle and ended up staying the night. My parents' home and my apartment were conveniently located just a 15-minute walk apart, and it was my eldest son who had suggested I live near my parents' home. He was concerned about me and thought it would be better for me to be closer to them. While his concern touched me, it also made me a little sad to leave the house where I had spent so many years. One day, when I had been out on a rare business-related outing and returned in the evening, I was in for a surprise. To my disbelief, Jessica had let herself into my apartment using the spare key I had given to my son, without telling me. Oh, welcome back, she said, lying on the floor in front of the TV, not even bothering to get up. 
I was taken aback and felt uncomfortable knowing that she had been in my apartment while I was away. I told her sternly, Jessica, that spare key is meant to be used in emergencies, not for you to let yourself in when I'm not home. It was the first time I had firmly asserted myself with her. She seemed surprised because I was usually quick to forget my anger, but this time I held my ground. Her response was less than pleasant. You really are a stingy mother-in-law, she yelled at me. I can't stand that about you, and I can't stand anything about you, not even this apartment. We're a family, so you should leave. She tried to usher me out the front door. It became clear that Jessica couldn't stand the thought of me living in this apartment. She was upset that her family was living in the old house while I occupied this place. According to her, it was unfair that the rent for this apartment was being paid by my son, James. She believed that it wouldn't be strange for us, as his family, to live here. In her mind, it was a matter of living within our means. Jessica's perspective helped me understand why she was constantly showing up at my apartment. She believed that this apartment should have been a place for her family to live, and she was not shy about expressing her displeasure. In the end, I decided to agree with her demands. All right, I will leave, I retorted, staring her down. I promised to move my belongings out within three days. Jessica, still skeptical, demanded that I call the moving company right there in front of her. I didn't waste a moment and immediately called a moving service for my smartphone, scheduling them to come in two days. As Jessica left, satisfied with the resolution, I watched her retreating figure and began formulating a plan for my new life in a senior-specific apartment. It was time for a fresh start and a peaceful living environment. After much contemplation, I made the decision to embark on a two-month trial of a significant change in my life. It involved the rather unsettling task of handing over both the keys to my cherished apartment and the accompanying lease documents to Jessica, all in the hopes of initiating a contractual alteration through the mediation of our trusty real estate agent, who would ultimately convey our request to the landlord. Fortunately, my history with the landlord spanned many years, and this long-standing relationship proved to be the beacon of flexibility and understanding I had been hoping for during this tumultuous period. Their willingness to accommodate our requested changes in such a congenial manner was, to say the least, an immense relief to me. However, my eldest son, whose emotions were running high and his patience dwindling, was not as pleased with this development. In fact, he was furious with Jessica for what he perceived as her kicking me out of our beloved apartment. The strain in their relationship had reached a point where he was seriously contemplating divorce. Oddly enough, though, Jessica appeared unperturbed by his inner turmoil, displaying a surprising level of indifference. On the contrary, she seemed to have embraced the idea of living alone in our apartment and boldly declared her desire for us to live separately. I couldn't help but marvel at her audacity in the face of such a complex and emotional situation. However, what Jessica did not know was that in a mere five days, she would come face to face with the truth, and it would change everything. As I continued with my remote work, my phone began to ring incessantly. The caller ID displayed Jessica's name, and I had been eagerly anticipating this moment. I had a record ready and waiting to document the impending conversation. Calmly, I pressed the record button and answered the call. Excuse me, mother, Jessica's voice rang out. What's the deal with the rent for this apartment? Why do I have to pay it? This isn't right. Jessica's words triggered a relentless tirade, and it was evident that she was thoroughly flustered. I decided to maintain my composure and respond deliberately. Oh, but Jessica, aren't you the current leaseholder? It's only right that you should pay. Is there a problem? My tone was calculated, designed to provoke and annoy Jessica further. To my amusement, the flustered Jessica seemed to become even more agitated. 
But didn't James use to pay the rent here? We're not even divorced yet, so shouldn't James pay it? She retorted. At this point, it was clear that Jessica was desperately trying to shift the financial responsibility onto my eldest son's shoulders. In reality, there was never a time when my son had contributed to the rent. In fact, I had been discreetly providing him with financial support all along. Even after retiring from my job, I continued to work as a consultant for the same company and earned a substantial salary. Additionally, I had taken on advisory roles in the industry, offering my expertise and earning a respectable income based on my well-established reputation. It was safe to say that my earnings far surpassed the those of my eldest son. While I had been keeping my financial support a well-guarded secret, it was time for the truth to come to light. So, Jessica, it's a misunderstanding on your part, I calmly explained. Originally, I was the one paying the rent for that place. I didn't make James pay a dime. The revelation left Jessica in a state of shock, her grand plans of independent living in our new apartment crumbling before her eyes. She managed to utter a few more words before abruptly ending the call. Immediately, I contacted my eldest son and allowed him to listen to the recorded conversation. His exhaustion from repaying Jessica's mounting debts was palpable, and I understood the burden he was carrying. As a parent, it was only natural for me to extend a helping hand, even if others deemed me too lenient. My son responded softly, I'll divorce her. I'm tired too. And with that admission, our journey toward addressing this challenging chapter in our lives began in earnest. Guided by a newfound sense of resolve and unity, I sat down with my son, sharing my intricate plan and providing him with a set of detailed instructions. It was crucial that he followed these steps to the letter, and I needed him to understand the gravity of the situation. My first request was for him to take a leave of absence from work, spanning approximately three days starting from today. This would be the initial phase of our carefully orchestrated strategy. With a hushed tone and a stern look, I directed him to execute the most crucial aspect of the plan, the discreet removal of his essential belongings from the house. It was imperative that he accomplish this without alerting Jessica his soon-to-be ex-wife, to our intentions. I emphasized the importance of keeping this operation under the radar, ensuring that no large moving trucks or suspicious activities would draw her attention, potentially causing complications. My instructions also included a specific timeline. I advised my son to gradually move his possessions during the cover of nightfall. The destination for these crucial items was carefully chosen, a single-family home hidden from Jessica's knowledge. I had scarred the area extensively to find this discreet location, which would serve as his final dwelling. Our plan was designed to unfold discreetly, shrouded in secrecy, with each step executed meticulously to minimize any potential hiccups or interruptions. Three days later, we would put our strategy to the test. Then, as anticipated, the phone rang once more, and the caller ID displayed Jessica's name. This time, her voice was laden with an even greater sense of urgency and agitation. Curiously, I greeted her, maintaining an intentionally relaxed and composed tone, but it was clear that Jessica was on the verge of panic. Her distress was palpable, and her words tumbled out in a rush. Mother, our house is up for sale, and I received a call from my parents. They informed me that my belongings have arrived at their house. What does this mean? It became apparent that my eldest son had followed through with my instructions precisely. He had relocated Jessica's possessions to her parents' house and listed the house they once shared for sale, leaving it empty. The landlord had promptly issued an ultimatum, stating that if the rent remained unpaid, Jessica would need to vacate the premises. The situation had escalated quickly, and Jessica was now in a state of near hysteria. With a sense of finality in my voice, 
I responded, Jessica, there are a few things I want to correct. The time had come to address all the pent-up frustration and grievances that had accumulated over time. Firstly, I am no longer your mother-in-law, I asserted firmly. Yesterday, James filed for divorce, and you signed the papers, didn't you? The divorce had been a long time coming, primarily because of Jessica's habit of using divorce as a weapon to manipulate my eldest son. I explained that my son had signed the divorce papers and officially submitted them to the city office. It was a bold step, given his deep love for Jessica when they initially married. However, he had come to realize that her constant threat of divorce was an unhealthy pattern, one that had left him with no alternative. The divorce papers have been formally accepted, I added, emphasizing the irrevocable nature of the situation. You always said to James that you could divorce any time. Aren't you satisfied now that things have gone your way? My voice was calm, but the tension hung in the air. On the other end of the line, Jessica seemed to be holding her breath, searching for words to respond. Frustration must have been coursing through her veins as she was unable to articulate a retort. Moreover, I couldn't help but express genuine concern for her post-divorce prospects. I pointed out the practical challenges she would face, including her financial situation and the costs associated with relocation. How did you even manage to pay this amount? I inquired, genuinely surprised. Jessica's frustration was no longer concealed. It erupted into a tirade of anger and curses directed at me. In that moment, it was clear that our carefully orchestrated plan had unfolded precisely as intended, though the repercussions were unfolding in ways that no one could have predicted. She spoke of her union with my son in a manner that was nothing short of confounding. According to her, the marriage was a consequence of her late husband's inheritance, which she asserted was now under her stewardship. In a tone that pierced the air, she vehemently declared her inability to so much as budge a single penny from this newfound wealth. It was as if she had been bound by some invisible financial straitjacket. The anguished cry that followed was a stark contrast to her earlier tirade. Her grievances flowed freely as she lamented the unfortunate turn of events. It was evident that her matrimonial ties had been forged under the weight of insurmountable debts. I chose not to intervene, allowing my son to eavesdrop on this exchange, understanding that it might serve as valuable evidence in case of a future divorce. As Jessica's tirade continued, I patiently waited for it to run its course, a task that demanded significant endurance. For approximately a quarter of an hour, she ranted unabated, her words like a storm of frustration and discontent. Then something shifted. The tone of her voice softened, and the anger that had once consumed her gave way to desperate pleas. She confided in me, revealing her disconnection from her own family, who had disowned her due to her profligate spending and borrowing habits. Tearfully, she begged for assistance, her voice quivering with vulnerability. As I listened, I couldn't help but feel a pang of sympathy for her though I remained steadfast in my resolve to view her predicament as a consequence of her actions. Apologies and regrets, it seemed, held little sway over our relationship now. We were, after all, strangers, and there was little more to be said. With a curt farewell, I ended the conversation, finally exhaling a sigh of relief. However, the drama did not end there. My eldest son later informed me that Jessica had caused a scene at his workplace, leading to the involvement of law enforcement. Upon returning home, he discovered that she had been forcibly locked out of their shared apartment, with the landlord having changed the locks during her absence. It appeared that she had been attempting to reach us, but we had preemptively disconnected our phones and changed our numbers. Jessica's desperation must have been palpable when she found herself unable to communicate with us. She was left with no choice but to turn to her estranged family for help. However, her return home was met with a cold reception, 
as her family had left her belongings, which I had sent to them, exposed to the elements in the backyard. Adding insult to injury, the unpaid rent for her apartment had been billed to her parents, further stroking their anger. There were rumors going about that Jessica had taken up residence in an apartment furnished by a homeless support organization. When I ran into her on the street, it was immediately apparent how drastically her situation had changed. Her skin had become dull and her once vibrant hair had gone a ghostly white, all signs of the stress she had been under. Seeing her change demonstrated how a person's living circumstances could have a significant impact on their well-being. It served as a sobering reminder of the effects of decisions made. In my case, I had made a fresh start in a home that I had bought with my late husband's fortune. Because it was a duplex, my son could remarry if he so desired. We, they ate meals together, but other than that, he took care of business on his own. The proceeds from the sale of my parents' house were set aside for my son, his future wife, and, of course, any future grandkids, with due consideration for their requirements. I fulfilled a lifelong ambition by tending to an English garden in the peace and quiet of my new home. I would tend to the yew trees and plants on days when work did not require my attention. I found comfort and meaning in their growth. Full of hope, this new life had become my everyday ritual, a reminder of the human spirit's resiliency and the potential for recovery.